Okay. Uh, I was asked to introduce the NSS Waters Program, and I have to say that I'm very proud to do that because uh, it really was my idea when I was a commissioner. Having said that, I thought it would be best to begin at the very beginning. And the very beginning uh, was really defined by my second commissioner's meeting. Uh, prior to that, I was always astounded by our lack of knowledge of the many creeks that we have around Pennsylvania. And uh, I was also amazed at uh, the way the agency's mission statement was structured. It was backwards, I thought, because it put the people before the resource and it was difficult for me to understand how in the world the people could enjoy the resource unless the, that came first. So what I did was rework the mission statement and uh, put the notion of protecting, conserving, and enhancing the aquatic resources of the Commonwealth before that of providing fishing and boating opportunities. And I hope that all makes sense to you folks. And I got the commissioners to pass uh, that change in our mission statement. And I suppose this goes to show that if you actually have a goal and you have a plan in mind as to how to get there and the will to do it, you can actually accomplish things from time to time. So the next issue then was to try to define what the resource was. Because I heard all sorts of statements. I heard people say the resource was the anglers because they buy the licenses. I heard people say the resource was the hatcheries because without stocking we wouldn't have any fishing. And I heard all sorts of other statements and I said, although this notion of resource first has existed for some time as a philosophy, we ought to really go to the trouble of trying to define what in the world the resource is. So I set about trying to do that, and I wrote the first of what turned out to be many dozens of drafts of what is now the resource first policy for the Fish and Boat Commission. I then consulted uh, John Arway, who was not our executive director at the time, and uh, also my, my good friend Bob Bachman, who I had hoped would be here today, uh, and uh, asked them for help. And we spent countless, countless hours writing that thing, and we finally were able to define the, aqua the, the, the resource. We were able to establish the notion that a healthy aquatic resource is really the collateral that defines and secures all the fishing and boating activity within the Commonwealth and without having a policy, not a philosophy, but a policy on the part of the commissioners that all the activities of this agency will be devoted toward assuring that we have a healthy aquatic resource in this commonwealth, we probably cannot optimize uh, the value of the fishery and the value of the boating opportunities within the commonwealth. So that's how that came about and it was passed and to the best of my knowledge it still exists as a policy. Very, very important. Then I said, let's, let's, let's talk about this for a moment. We have a mission statement that says we're going to protect, we're going to conserve, and we're going to enhance. And uh, we really think that the aquatic resource is important. Uh, how come we don't know more about it? I can remember sitting in a meeting and saying, how can you guys tell me you're going to manage this aquatic resource when you don't know what it is or where it is? We've got to figure out a way to better define what in the world aquatic resources of this commonwealth are. That's when the notion of the unassessed waters program began. I got the usual kind of statements, well, you know, we can't very well do this because we don't have enough people. That's true. We don't have enough money. That's also true. It's going to make a lot of people angry. It did. Still does. But I said, it doesn't make any difference. If you go all the way back to the Fish and Boat Code, it's clear, and Mike showed this, that the reason this agency was formed was to try to uh, correct some of the errors that have come about from our history, and you can't escape your history. The greatest concern was that of uh, urban sprawl. So, so how are we going to do this? I said, well, we got a bunch of colleges out there with very, very qualified people and students who are willing to learn and become interns. Let's go talk to these colleges. Well, I had worked with a guy by the name of Mel Zimmerman from Dr. Zimmerman from Lycoming College. He started what's known as the Clean Water Institute. I bought him a shocker some years ago with some grant money that I got. 
so he could have an updated piece of equipment. I went to Mel, asked him if he would help us with this idea of trying to assess the waters of Lycoming County in particular to determine what the wild trout populations were in those waters, and he said yes. Having said that, we were astonished to discover how many waters held significant populations of wild brook trout and brown trout that had never been documented. So I talked to Leroy Young at the time about this. I talked to John Arway at the time. And while this was going on, the Marcella shale activity uh, accelerated significantly. And my district at that time had more Marcella shale activity than any district uh, in the Commonwealth. So I felt a greater sense of urgency than ever before. So I went back and said, listen, we've got to fix this. Well, we discovered that the colleges could do the same quality of work that the Fish and Boat Commission people were doing for a whole lot more money, or less money, excuse me, a whole lot less money. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sounds like government, doesn't it? <laughs> they do it for more money, why not go ahead and do it? Anyhow, having said that, for a whole lot less money, uh, we also discovered that uh, they were able to get out in the field and, and identify streams that we, quite frankly, didn't have the time to identify. These kids and professors actually went out in tents and camped out so they could avoid wasting time traveling from one piece of water to another. I don't think we were doing that. So all of a sudden, we, we needed someone to be in charge of this, and I'm going to hand over the microphone very quickly, because we, developed, we established that we had the money to do things. We established that we had the, the people in the form of these various colleges and people, uh, students. The problem was we needed someone to, to head this thing up, and thank goodness Bob Weber was put in charge of that. And I have to tell you something. Uh, I've met a lot of very highly qualified, committed people within, within this agency. And uh, Bob Weber is one of those at the very top. He's done an extraordinary job with this Unassessed Waters program. And I absolutely believe that the, it wouldn't be anywhere near where it is today without him. So now we have at least two challenges, I think. One is to continue to assess the many waters that we haven't uh, uh, measured yet. The other is then to figure out a way to go back and keep track of these waters. Now that we've established a baseline for so many of these waters, it's going to be important to see if, if, if whatever is in there changes. We can't wait until they're already hurt because we know how difficult, sometimes impossible, and certainly expensive it is to try to reestablish waters after they've been damaged. So we've got two issues here, and therefore I suspect that this unassessed waters program will eventually be named something else, but it should probably go on into perpetuity and certainly a lot longer than Bob and I are around. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to someone else. That's the history of the unassessed waters program. That's how it came about.